Good evening. I'm Bill McDonald, and I uh, live in Greater Pittsburgh, uh, just south of the border. Some of the students call it the University of Southwestern Pennsylvania. <laughs> that would be WVU. Um, I'm here to talk a bit about Oakwilt. Most of my experience, and I've worked with Oakwilt for about 35 years at West Virginia University, uh, comes from work in a forest ecosystem. But this is a disease that transcends forests when it infects city forests and, and certainly affects uh, urban forests uh, from the standpoint of me, even street trees and so forth. I call your attention to the leaves you see in the picture. Uh, Phil showed a few earlier, but one of the principal uh, symptoms of oak wilt is finding leaves on the ground in mid-July that look in some cases green, some look water soaked, some look brown as the leaves he showed, but you just think, well this is strange to see leaves falling off a tree and they fall off rapidly and uh, make a very strong statement that something is wrong with the tree. The tree has wilted. I tell my students, and I've never had any of my professional co colleagues challenge the statement that I don't know of any pathogen of oak or any tree that's as virulent as this particular fungus. It's capable of killing the largest oak within 30 days. The, the good point is it doesn't get around to do that very often. It's a very ineffectively disseminated disease. It's a disease that's very much like Dutch elm disease. Some of you probably are familiar with it or have seen it. It's a vascular wilt disease. The fungus travels in the vascular system of the host. So let's take a look at some images here and see if we can make some sense out of it. Let's see. The one point I want to make is this is a disease largely of the red oak group. Uh, red, scarlet, pin, black, and so forth. They are very susceptible to the disease. White oaks as a group are quite resistant. Uh, that's fortunate, I think, for our ecosystem. The uh, European oaks are largely white oaks, and we made the big assumption years ago, the Europeans are concerned about this disease being exported to Europe, and we were concerned some years ago in helping them sort that out that we inoculated a lot of European oaks in, in this country, and we find out that their white oaks, which we kind of made the mistaken assumption were resistant, drop like flies. They're as susceptible as our red oaks. Now what's that mean for us? There's a lot of red oak or a lot of white oaks planted in the United States, I'm sure in Pittsburgh here, that are English oaks or European oaks. They are in fact quite susceptible. This image here shows oak wilt as it was known in about 1951. The disease was discovered in Wisconsin and the organism identified in the late 40s. Um, so the pink area represents the first area where it was found and there were reports in the literature back in the 1800s of oaks dying and no one, none really had any explanation for it until it was sorted out in Wisconsin that it was in fact the disease of oak. And a lot of people say it probably wouldn't have emerged as a disease had a, a lot of the white pine not been cut over in Wisconsin and oaks came back in great abundance and they oftentimes were almost purity and they were grafted to each other and so forth. So the disease began to express itself in Wisconsin. And my predecessor at WVU, I asked him when I first took the job there, when he'd retired, I said, Phil, when did you first find oak wilt in West Virginia? He says, it was after I returned from a workshop at the University of Wisconsin and saw the disease for the first time. I drove into Mon County and there it was. So it was a matter of so few trees dying of oak wilt that uh, most people just kind of ignored it, especially through the Appalachians. So you can see how it spread basically through about 1951 into other counties here in the eastern part of the U.S. This is the current map, pretty much the same map that Phil showed, but I'd like to point out these are different, uh, if, if, a, if a single tree has oak wilt, that county has gotten is red. So that doesn't imp imp imply anything about the frequency of the disease. But rather interestingly, the disease was never known to the northeast of the Susquehanna. My colleagues at Penn State said there's no reason to explain why it hasn't crossed the Susquehanna because all the factors are present on the other side of the river that are on the side it occurs on, but it never crossed until this year, or excuse me, three years ago, and you see the little red spot up near Albany, New York. No one knows how that got there, but I suspect it was carried by people. 
And they made a, a Herculean effort in Albany to try to eradicate the disease. I circle this area of West Virginia. This is an area we've done much of our research in over the years, and it happens to be an area where the highest incidence of oak wilt occurs in our state. There's more in the southern part of the state. There's a good bit of oak wilt in western Maryland, some in south central Pennsylvania as well. But I, I talked about this disease being a reasonably rare disease. These were some figures when we had a statewide survey, how many trees died statewide in West Virginia, where every county that was known to have oak wilt was surveyed by air. And you can see there's relatively little variation. In some years, the numbers go up a bit, and that's thought to be years when there were wounds made to the trees where insects could inhabit those wounds and uh, transmit the disease successfully. So if you look at our whole state, we don't really have that many trees to die of oak wilt. Now that's not very comfortable, com com comforting if it's your tree in your front yard or your neighborhood that has the disease. There's two means by which this disease is disseminated. The first is insect transmission, and fortunately, that is very ineffective, very inefficient, and that's why the disease seems to be pretty well held in check. The second is root graft transmission, and it is the major disseminator of the disease. But let's take a look at these uh, insect transmission. The first group of insects, which are largely the, the group that are the, can be implicated, are the picnic beetles, or sap-feeding beetles. Uh, they are not beetles that penetrate the bark or anything. They simply like uh, the, the type of beetles that might visit your picnic and find your cantaloupe on the table very attractive. They like fragrant smelling things and they're pretty abundant in our environment. There's probably 60 different species or so that have been thought to be possible vectors of oak wilt. Uh, some of the bark beetles, which are what spreads principally spreads uh, Dutch elm disease, have been very difficult to demonstrate their effective vectors. These are a couple of the picnic beetles, or nitidulabias, two of the prim principal ones. And for them to be effective vectors, they have to acquire the fungus. And this particular fungus produces a really unique structure. It's called a mat, some people call it a pad, that forms between the bark and the wood on a tree that's infected and been colonized by the fungus. That mat and pad pushes the bark off. And it is a very fragrant pad. Unfortunately, I left the cultures of the fungus in my truck. Everybody could have had a chance to smell it. You'd love it. It's a great odor. And you can see why the insects love it. They, they frequent these pads and they pick up from the pads, they pick up spores. This is the fungus in culture. And the spores, this is, these are the asexual spores. You can see they're kind of unique. They come out of the tip of the filaments of the fungus. And the, and the insects pick them up and they're off and running. What, what are the insects looking for? Something else fragrant to, to, to uh, inhabit. There may be a sap wound. It may be a sap wound on a tree in the spring when maybe there's been a storm. It may be somebody who's pruned a tree in their yard. That's a principal mechanism of uh, entry. Whatever type of wound it, it occurs, oftentimes if it's a fresh wound, the nitidulids will find it and begin feeding on it. Feeding on the sap in the wound and can transmit the disease in doing so. Once the fungus gets into the tree, I think you can see this is a vessel of a tree. I think you can see some of the spores in the one vessel. And as the tree, as the tree is colonized by the fungus, once it's in, uh, in the tree, it begins to produce plugs in the vessels. As a response to that infection, the tree gets plugged up, and that's it. It's just like it's being strangled internally. OK, now. The major mechanism by which spread occurs, and we might not even have oak wilt on the radar screen if, if the situation in Wisconsin and, and Michigan and Minnesota, what hadn't come forward back in the, in the 1940s and 50s, was the, the spread through root grafts. Now, if you were a tree growing next to another, you had an oak tree growing next to another oak tree, in all likelihood, your roots are, have, you have roots in common. So if you contract oak wilt, the adjacent tree contracts oak wilt. And I ask you, of these two scenarios, which would you rather, which, where's the greater chance of transmission? On the same species, exactly. And that's what occurs in areas where oak wilt is most damaging in North America. Uh, we are fortunate in the Appalachians, we have a lot of diversity. So a lot of times you don't find the same species growing next to each other, and then you don't have the root graft problem. But rest assured, if there are root grafts, oak wilt is disseminated. There are some pictures of root grafts, and you don't have to do, we did some pressure washing on one of our sites in West Virginia, and the root grafts are, the numbers of them are just simply amazing. Okay. 
Here's an infection center. A lot of times in our forest we have an infected tree, which you see in the middle, surrounding by, surrounded by trees that have acquired the disease as a result of root grafting. So these infection centers develop in small areas, may fade out over time if there's uh, not another tree to, to which to pass the disease. This was a small study we had done some years ago where we looked at woodlot, and you can see the components. Red oak, 29 percent. Just watch that figure. This, has an oak, this is an oak wilt infested uh, woodlot, 23 percent 10 years later, 17 percent 20 years later. The composition has changed gradually as those oak wilt infected trees have succumbed. This is an image in Minnesota. Minnesota has real problems with oak wilt. If you drove through the Twin Cities, you'd probably see billboards that say, don't prune trees in the spring. And this is a farm lot, a wood lot basically, and oak wilt there has spread largely by root grafting. It's a very significant problem. It can be a little bit of a problem in our cities. We certainly have problems here in Pittsburgh. We've got problems in Morgantown. And the question is, what's the strategy for breaking these root grafts between trees that might be potentially root grafted? So there's all kinds of designs, and there's been a lot of research on what, how far you have to be away from a tree that's infected to effectively cut the root graft and so forth. This represents primary barriers and, and some secondary barriers that were put in in this little schematic. Here's an area in Minnesota, significant oak wilt. This is occurring big time in Texas as well. And what they've done in some areas in Minnesota is they've gone in and they've cut out the dead trees and trenched in that particular part of the forest to try to stop the disease. And, and it's been reasonably successful. A lot of trenching tools. You don't use these in many of our forests around the, the central Appalachians unless you love rocks and it just, it just doesn't work properly. Uh, in Texas they don't mess around. <laughs> They use earth saws, and that works very effectively. The, Texas, the root systems in Texas are quite deep, and there they've got a problem with live oak and oak wilt, big time. Dallas, Austin, just about every major city. Uh, but they've been able to combat it by, by treating these root grafts. Certainly uh, systemic chemicals, such as Alamo, appropriately named, uh, can be used to prevent oak wilt. They don't really act as a... Uh, therapeutic treatment because the disease moves so rapidly in the tree. Okay, so the spread of oak wilt is slow, it's erratic, we're fortunate it's that way, principally because there's not much overland transmission. Uh, and root graft transmissions are what really maintains the disease in most areas of the U.S. Uh, and I was impre impressed, I think our, the, the Parks Conservancy here has taken a really aggressive approach to trying to eliminate the root grafts and restrict the disease in the parks where it occurs here in Pittsburgh. I applaud their efforts. Thank you very much.